Hey, Mary, how are you? Okay, how are you? All right, your audio is working. How are you feeling? I think I'm out of the worst of it. I got a quarantine through this week, but uh, it's kind of like a standard winter cold at this point. Yeah. When it first came on, it was more like the flu type symptoms, so definitely far better. That's good. Yeah, for sure. You see Muhammad, uh, Mary, tech support that should have the files for. Her. You're on mute. I haven't seen him. I can walk over and see if he's there. There is. Uh, I can text him. He might not be here because I told him I was setting up the live stream. So. Uh, do you have access to the um, but Jen? Do you have access to the electronic docs? Nope. All right. See what uh. Let me yeah. see if he's in there. Well, text, text him. Uh, if it's easy enough for Jen just to text okay. him. See if he can send you the docs, Jen. If he's, uh, for some reason, he thought he was uh, no longer doing it. <laughs> like in the winter style, Dr. Hall. What do you think, Miss Martin? Uh, I will always be a fan of the shirt and tie. No, the winter style. Look at his, uh, he's got like the. Yeah, I, I'll choose to ignore the the scruff. That's okay. <laughs> you are such a traditionalist. <laughs> I am nothing, if not that. <laughs> As you all know, there are no surprises with me. Yeah. <laughs> uh. I'm trying to convince him to grow the full hipster style beard, but he can't make it happen with military duty. For the record, I couldn't hear anything until 20 seconds ago. That's for the best. Um, Mohammed, <laughs> you very nice, Jim, for the record. <laughs> and we are live Happy on YouTube. Oh. Miss Myers, I'm sorry, you were commenting. We're live on YouTube, so uh, no blue humor. <laughs> and you said you did get a hold of Muhammad. Yes, you said one second. Okay, excellent. Thank you. I'm going to go back to mute. I'm not sure who's on the um, personnel subcommittee. You do have, with yourself, three committee members. I see Mr. Rossi and Ms. Oh, I, thought it was, I, I thought Dominic was on this one. Am I, is that he may, wrong? He may be. Yes. I, it's so, Connie, Dominic, and Eileen. Okay, so with Eileen and Connie, she has a quorum of the subcommittee, though. Right? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's 631. I think we can give Dominic a couple minutes. Absolutely. Let me text him as well. Okay. I just hung up with the mayor and he may, I think he may be getting on as well. Great.
to the brain. Oh, it's too dark. And then from the admin, I believe you had heard from the solicitor's office, Mr. McKenna was going to be joining us. Can you hear me, Connie? Yep, I can hear you. Uh, yeah, so I, I talked to uh, Attorney McKenna maybe an hour ago. He said he was going to drive home and he'd get on hopefully right at 630, but he could be a few minutes delayed. Okay. Um, I would say we could do that is... first so he didn't have to stay through the whole, through the whole meeting. I'm sorry. You... Mary? Oh, I'm sorry, Con. Um, Sakari's in the waiting room, just waiting to get in. Jen? Nope, oh, there he is. Yep, I was just downloading the documents from Mohammed. Oh, I have them now. Okay. There we go. Okay, and we have Dominic here. So I would uh, call this subcommittee meeting of the Personnel and Labor Relations Subcommittee to order and ask if the clerk could please call the roll. Chairperson Martin? Here. Mr. Rossi? Here. Mr. Lay? Here. Three present. Thank you very much. So we do have the, the two items. I don't see Mr. McKenna on here yet. So I'd, I'd say we'll start with the first item. If there's a natural breaking point, if he does arrive, we can we can make that shift just so he doesn't have to sit through the whole meeting if it's not necessary. So our first topic is uh, our continuing goals discussion uh, with the superintendent having submitted uh, his goals a couple times to us for review. Um, I don't think we need to go through the whole package. Uh, Mr. Boyd, but uh, what I, Dr. Boyd, but what I would say is that if you could pull out for us um, the areas that you want us to focus on tonight regarding the concrete measures that we'll be using for some of these goals. Thank you, Ms. Martin. That's uh, absolutely what I think would be the best use of our time here, at least if I can get some ad additional guidance from the committee mm -hmm. in session tonight. So first, I want to thank the full committee. I'm looking forward to tonight's meeting and accommodating the health and safety protocols by doing it via Zoom. Uh, I appreciate the, the committee's accommodation there and for our community while we're returning to normalcy. Clearly, these types of accommodations are still needed as COVID is going to be with us for some time. There's a uh, so where uh, we left off and where we're going. So at the, when I first submitted these, what I understood is that. In broad terms, they were aligned with what the committee was looking for. There's, I submitted them in the same format we used for the past uh, the past three years, and there were so there were some minor revisions. Each time I brought them back, I brought back those additional minor revisions. I think I've accomplished all of the requests of the committee, with one glaring exception. Uh, so I heard three things that were requested from the committee as a whole. One is use more concise and direct language. We've done that across the document. That was one of the first things edits that we've done. The second, I believe I heard that from uh, Ms. Del Rossi and others. I heard from Ms. Doherty to make sure that it was clear what evidence would be submitted. Uh, we did make, I did make some revisions to a particular item that was uh, suggested by Ms. Martin around differentiated autonomy, uh, that that one didn't appear that it was clear as to what would be submitted. That should be very clear to the committee as to what's submitted now in terms of evidence. The last though that I could use guidance from the committee there's a, the committee has suggested that we would like to evolve and I would concur in a direction where we're starting to use more quantifiable metrics now that we're moving out of the, kind of the pandemic era. Challenge, as I mentioned previously, is largely around timing, which is not uh, of anyone's control right now amongst all of us, but clearly the fiscal year starts July 1, the school, the school year starts beginning of August, we're actually right now planning for next year with the quality improvement plans of schools. So establishing those types of metrics, even in October, which is the earliest that we do these, then going into revision into December, now we're in January, it makes it extremely difficult mid-year to make those uh, to make those types of decisions. 
that's that's one of the challenges. Um, the second, as I did talk with the team uh, and the various departments that have submitted these, but many of these, while they're very evidence-based and very specific and measurable, they don't align with something that would be metrics-oriented. So what I think would be best and most helpful, certainly, and the guidance that I could use is which of these targets would the committee like to highlight that I could certainly uh, try to work through with, uh, with some type of metrics that are going to allow us to use data in a meaningful and reasonable way. There's a, you'll notice one of the targets actually is, is getting out to finalizing the school-based performance dashboard or scorecard. That's we're working through with UML uh, in an ideal way. We would have those, those targets would go to schools and roll up to the district level and the committee would have clear alignment from school level to district level. We're getting very close to that and I, I'm hopeful that we're gonna be there uh, obviously based on these goals. I'm, I'm committing to being there by the end of this year. So there's a, that's, that's kind of a, a summary of where we've been. I'm hopeful that I can just kind of take some notes and the committee can look at the, the revised language and if there's any of them that you want us to highlight specifically, highlight that we need to continuously be reworked or uh, more specifically, just so that I can deliver on the committee's request, which again, I'm committed to as well, to try to quantify as many of these as we can without disrupting the work of the year. Circle those for me, highlight those for me, and I'll, I'll, I'll work to take those back to staff to see if we can work those through. I do have, uh, obviously, Mr. Dr. Hall's with us because he's uh, uh, does the admin rep for personnel, but I also asked Ms. Phillips to join us because a lot of our work around uh, a lot of these targets you'll see are within our, our work and our commitment to equity, and a lot of those are process-oriented goals as we drive to uh, changing the culture of the organization. So if there were questions specifically around uh, you know, the, what that deliverable was going to be, if it's not as clear, uh, Ms. Phillips is also available there to support those questions just to make sure that we can be more efficient so I don't have to take it back and, and provide you the answer at a later time. Uh, that about uh, concludes the update. Uh, Ms. Martin, unless there's any additional questions, I would love to just get the guidance of which ones to circle, highlight, so that I can make those revisions with staff. So I think, you know, as I had initially expressed, one of the key things I'd like is that within each goal area, we should have at least one, you know, one okay. that has an absolute kind of concrete measure that we're, that we're able to point to. Uh, I don't know if it makes sense as where, you know, looking at these, you know, I, not to, you know, cut short the presentation, but I'm right on the last page, which kind of, I think, lays it out in the most comprehensive way for our purposes. That's a um, snapshot, right? The, the cheat sheet for the rest of the committee. It's like a table. Thank you very much. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got the four goals listed with uh, each one having four kind of breakout goals from it. Um, so, uh, you know, my colleagues, if you're looking on the, the package, that's where it's at. Um, I don't know if it makes sense as, as everyone's looking at it to kind of, you know, we've got within the first goal, we've got inclusive classroom practices, the differentiated autonomy and support. It is slightly clearer. I do appreciate that. Um, the universal pre-K and then portrait of a graduate. Um, you know, the as I'm looking at it, and this is just my own, you know, looking at it, the universal pre-K does seem to lend itself to having a number attached to it in terms of the number and the percentage of increase that we would see by the end of the year. I don't that's know if certain. everybody has it or if you'd like us to put it up so you could see it. That's certainly that's certainly doable. The number we've had in there that we've used has been, we use uh, the phrase that we had in there is up to 100 additional seats. And the reason is, is that's in collaboration with uh, community partners. Uh, so setting a, a definitive uh, blanket number, it's been a range of up to 100, and you, you just had the update from uh, the early learning office on that. I believe the number that we're already up to is, I want to say, is 73 seats, Ms. Phillips, is the, uh, I believe, is what's already been accomplished. So the up to 100, that one we can definitely do without disrupting any type of process with, with the timing of where we are, um, for sure, if that works for the committee. I don't know if anyone else has any. Yes, Ms. Doherty. You muted. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I uh, I want to go back to what we've been talking about. I think are you know 
measurable goals, smart goals, right? So I looked at, let's just take goal one uh, about approving academics. And I tried to think like, what would be some really significant uh, data and movement that I think would mean a lot in terms of being able to be evidence that we're improving academics. And the first one I came up with, I think ties nicely with the portrait of a graduate. And that is the, um, the uh, percentage of ninth grade students who are passing all classes. Now I know that I had asked for that data a while ago uh, and that motion didn't pass. That was with a former committee. Uh, but there is a, the commissioner sends a letter, the DESA commissioner in his letter this week, they talk about how significant your ninth grade achievement is for as an early warning signal that you're going to graduate as opposed to be a dropout. So what I'd like to see, and I think this is something I think it would fit in with Dr. Boyd's concerns about it's late in the year to be refining this, but we've been talking about this for a while, having goals that we can actually measure and date, that we've been working towards uh, attendance reducing the dropout rate, all those things have been factors that should have should be aligned with all your plans around improving academics and student achievement. I think it'd be very easy to say, we are going to increase the percentage of ninth grade students who pass all their classes, and we're gonna measure it by looking at pre-pandemic levels, going back to 2018, 2019, um, and seeing, trying to get back to, that level. So for instance, I went in that commissioner's letter and I looked at, according to DESE data, for 2021, the percentage of ninth graders who passed all the classes was 46%. 46%, that's not even half of the kids passed all their classes. Um, by the way, that's lower than Lawrence, which, you know. Um, but in the 2018-2019 school year, which is the school the year that was pre-pandemic, the number of ninth graders who passed both classes was 53%. Still not where we want to be, especially when you look at Chelmsford, they're like in the 90%. And I know we don't, we're urban, we're different, but we're striving all the time to do better. So I'm thinking if we had a, a goal that said, we're going to try to get, we're going to cut that, that uh, rate down and and be able to measure that to look at the data. I think it shows us where where we're you know that we're making progress other than just saying we're doing it. And then the last one, and again, this is also related to our first goal, which I think is the heart of what we're trying to do: improve academics. That would be to look at chronic absenteeism. It's also a huge indicator of student achievement student dropout rates, all those things. And we know we've taken big hits on that through the pandemic. So again, do a similar kind of thing. Right now, I guess, according to DESE, uh, the 2021 the percent school year, the percentage of students who were chronically absent, meaning missing 10% or more of school, was 38.5% the last year. That's huge, right? Uh, but in 2018, 2019, it was 17.1%, half that. And I think that when we look at goals, we, we start with you, Dr. Boyd, you're the top of the, the organization, but we want SMART goals throughout the district. We want our teachers to be setting SMART goals. We want our administrators. And I think we, we do that by setting, setting an example of doing it. So those are just two examples I came up with that I think are reasonable um, in order to kind of gauge we're moving in the direction we want to be moving in. And that was just what I wanted to add. Thank you. Stacy has a, a question in the chat. I don't know if everyone can see that. Does chronic absence last year take into account COVID? I'm going to guess it doesn't, but. No, yeah, so they're, the students are absent. They're just excused absences. So uh, chronic absenteeism is 10%, missing 10% or more of the school year. So for a full year, it's 18 days. And as we progress through the year, uh, but yes, committee member Thompson, that's why you see us such a significant increase is related to the many things uh, surrounding COVID. Um, this year, I believe our first quarter attendance, and we're seeing progress towards closing all of those learning losses uh, across the organization. I believe this year, the average daily attendance, for instance, uh, was at 92% up from 90, but not completely back to where 
we were pre-COVID, clearly with us being on Zoom here, there's still COVID in the world here and we're still working through that, trying to get a sense on where that is. It's changed things significantly, but the improvement um, should be expected and is definitely uh, the direction we're heading and what we're seeing within the data. So uh, I don't, did that, in, so you're seeing it, the differences for a kid, it's excused, but it still is an absence from school. Um, in the first year, to elaborate on a little bit, in the first year of COVID, we had different codes for students because we had remote learning. So students would be coded as remote learners. They would still be attending. Uh, they're coded as remote learners. Last year, we didn't have that at all. So the students were absent from school altogether. And that was a lot of our very early discussions when uh, Ms. Thompson, I believe, is actually your first meeting on the committee when you got hit with those policy discussions. Hmm. So let me ask, um, beginning with the first one, because I do think that the, the passing rate for ninth graders is a, you know, that's a compelling statistic to be able to track over time. Um, the, the numbers that you're citing, uh, Ms. Doherty, that's for the first quarter that they're making comparisons? No, that was looking at those school years. So I, and I'm not in the school year. It right. was right. So they, I looked at, um, 2020. So the school year 2020 to 21 mm -hmm. was last year and 46% ended right. the year having passed all their classes. Right, 46% passed all. And then I went to 2018, 2019, and the number was 53%, which I still think isn't great. But, but the Wait, idea but is that we have, we're, we're looking to go somewhere on something that's very important to us, that we say this metric really means something. Right. If no, we, I absolutely we can, agree. And and you can get all the breakdowns by years. I'm just um, starting to maneuver my way around, Desi. Uh, I, I apologize that it's taken me this time, but I think we used to get more data than we have been getting. And I think that's been, it used to be handed to us in reports. Um, and I'm not seeing that so much now. So it's, um, you know, I'm, I've been trying to do it on my own. What was your question about that? Sorry. No, but I'm just trying to understand what the metric is like. So basically, if we were using that, we'd be looking to compare when we do our evaluation in you know the September timeframe, we should be able to get that percentage. It will have already been submitted to DESE, correct, Dr. Boyd? So we can get it, we can get any data. Uh, and yeah, we we submit the data up. So what you might not have, uh, based on how DESI turns around data, is you might not have the fully verified data that DESI submits back to us, but we submit it to them. So, you know, whatever, you know, at the conclusion of the year, we can pull the data, um, you know. So uh, let me, I can certainly take, take a look at that. I, I would concur. I think it's uh, pretty widely uh, understood that, you know, ninth, ninth grade year is a critical year. Um, and let me... Let me take a look at it. Uh, you can see that we're, we've been continuously doing work there. We feel really good about the direction that we're headed. And uh, let me take a look at the portrait of graduate goal and I'll circle that one. Okay, so then we'll be looking to receive back. Um, I mean, I do think putting the, the preschool number is, you know, that's a good one to include. And then we'll have this one that will be citing the, the percentage passing at the end of the, ninth grade under that first category. I will work on it. I'll certainly, I'm gonna certainly circle that and, and work on it. Okay. Um, unfortunately, my uh, desktop has just fallen apart so I don't have the form in front of me anymore. Um, the second category, the second goal. Second goal for our strategic plan should be around operational efficiency. And I believe what's already targeted in there that already hits the committee's request is around our enterprise resource planning. Uh, that's one that we did add the add the metrics within that uh, based on the committee request. Could you just say what that is for me? I'm sorry, because I can't get to anything now. Sure, I believe what the payroll office is uh, is reporting is the the confidence goal for the conversion within a ERP to biweekly pay is within a 95% confidence uh for rollout of the the first bi-weekly pay 
Okay. I mean, again, that's kind of happening, you know, regardless of, 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 you know, our efforts. Um, do we have anything on that list? And I know, again, to my colleagues, if anyone's taking a look at it, um, you know, something obviously around the, the kind of capital investments and the conversations we're having around, uh, you know, the material, the, the, we do. That's in the next category, Ms. Martin. Okay, I'm sorry. Welcome to schools. So you'll see there the uh, the two indicators there are to be able to bring back to the committee uh, to initiate the uh, five-year facility master planning process, as well as the second is to is to give the committee and committing to the committee with the revised uh, ESSER budgeting with a focus on facilities improvement. So those would be the two deliverables for the committee this year. I mean, I appreciate the the deliverables aspect of this, but I do think that we're looking to see, again, like the actual actions happening. I mean, my my thought is that we should be able to, even within this constricted timeline, by the end of June, we should have some investments that have been made. Is that accurate? Yes, I think the challenge in talking with our facilities department is that largely they hand off the work at a juncture to the DPW and to the contractors. And so mm -hmm. when they hand off the work to DPW or to the contractors, uh, as the committee has seen with the um, STEM project, they can't, they can't control those variables. And so they're, they're asking how they can be held to account for those variables that they don't control. There's the, the STEM modulars are an example of that, but that, that reflects every aspect of the facilities work that we undertake. That's the feedback from the facilities department, but I will certainly circle it and see if there's a way that we can refine that so that it's meaningful and, uh, for the committee and actually targets in the work to which uh, the facilities department will be attending at the end of the year. I mean, again, as we're looking at this and you can, as you review it with your staff as well, I mean, I think we should be zeroing in on a finite amount that we're planning on spending in the next two years on this. Okay. Yeah, you know, not saying that that can't change or shift, but I mean, there should be a, 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 a hard number that we're looking at. Um, and I think that the danger in that, I mean, and recognizing that definitely we don't have control over a lot of these things, but at the very least, we need to be tracking against it so that we're not coming up at the end of, you know, year four with money that we were meant to spend on facilities that suddenly now we're repurposing and going through this whole process again. Um, and, and I mean, that's what I really want us to be able to guard against that, you know, again, these are, we've said it a million times, the one-time money is we're never going to see this again. We need to really stay on top of the spending on it and get the most we can out of it in a timely way. So I think if you could go back and kind of come up with, again, it, it's a targeted goal. And, and the reality is, is that things can get in the way of goals all the time. So, but I think if we have the goal set, then at least we're measuring it against something, you know, concrete. Certainly. I could certainly circle that one. And, uh, that gives us uh, the last one is around family and community um, engagement. That's the last fourth mm -hmm. one. So you've worked across the three uh, columns. I'm sorry, I know the court of my eye, I'm seeing Ms. Thompson's hand on the, the icon. I don't know if that's- Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, that's me. That's okay. Please go right ahead. I'm sorry, I apologize. That's entirely okay. So this was going back to the um, one where we just saw, which is the second one. Um, that one also talks about the diversity and the diversity hiring and recruitment process. I was wondering if there can be something more succinct surrounding that because it does seem like, you know, something that's kind of a little bit ambiguous. And I think that um, if this is our true pledge and our commitment, then there needs to be something a little bit more specific or measurable attached to it. Um, I was thinking something more specifically surrounding because when you're thinking about diversity recruitment hiring, my thought is always about the process, right? So the process in itself how do we make sure that the gatekeepers, and by gatekeepers, I mean anybody that has anything, any touch point in, in the HR process, the hiring process. So whether that's a principal or that's, you know, um, somebody who's the head of HR, um, how do we measure how much anti-bias training that they're getting, how much anti-racism training that they're getting um, to ensure that there's some measure of accountability? Because I feel like it's it's really challenging for us to to get that 
Um, and it's not that people don't speak towards it, but I think that if there was something measurable to make sure that we knew that all the principals were taking the certain amount of trainings, all the, so everybody had the same lens that they were operating out of. Um, that was just a thought of mine that when I looked at, looked at that, to have something that was more finite, I think would be a great thing for us to be able to say, oh, we had six trainings on um, anti-racism, anti-bias training, and that everybody across the district was held responsible for that. Um, so that's just a thought. I'd add on to that too. And I'm going to say in advance that as soon as I finish talking, I need to walk away for one quick second. But, um, you know, it seems like that's an opportunity to use a pre and a post testing kind of protocol where if we're taking all of our principals, all of our, all of our hiring managers, for lack of a better term, through this kind of training, which I, you know, is absolutely, I think, very important, we should be able to build into that training kind of a metric that we are testing out the, the, how impactful it is. And even if that's just, you know, you take a test at the beginning and take a test at the end that shows progress, that would give you a, a number that you could, you know, again, I don't pretend that those give you the whole picture, but it at least gives you one thing that you can measure. No, I actually think I'm pretty, I'm fairly confident. That's one that uh, we can, we can work in at this, even at this time of year. Um, it's actually the HR office and the equity office are planning to give an updated presentation to the committee at the next meeting. We got some pretty exciting work happening there. I'm really excited about the progress we're making with the diversity hiring index, which I actually think can be a model across. Uh, we had some uh, great developments in here and uh, we're looking forward to being able to make that operational going into this, this hiring season in the spring. So. Mm -hmm. That's one. Let me take that one back. Let me circle it and uh, see what we can put through. But I appreciate that, Ms. Thompson, because what you're talking about there is, is saying, you know, how many individuals going into the hiring season of hiring managers have been moved through some type of training. That's something we, we do measure and we should be able to get you something on that. But let me take it back to those who do. Track it and, Excellent. Uh, come up there for you. And I was also thinking towards uh, Ms. Martin's point about that being attached somehow to an evaluation process. Um, one of the things, and I know this is gonna sound a little bit radical, but I, one of the things that I have considered, and I don't know that the district is doing it, is having student evaluations. Um, I think it's really helpful to have those types of things, those types of touch points. I know they don't always feel warm and fuzzy. When I was a teacher, I did them. They didn't always feel warm and fuzzy, but they were really helpful for me. And um, I was just wondering if the district would consider something like that, how hard that would be to roll out. But I do think that there's a benefit in having the students that are either, it's almost like in, in my thought process is almost like the seniors, almost like an exit interview. So like when you leave your job, you have an exit interview. So I was thinking like having the seniors give an exit um, review or exit um, evaluation. So that's just something I was also thinking about. Yeah, so there's, um... The sur a survey of students, I think, is always a good idea. Once it starts crossing into evaluation language, that's where we start crossing into uh, the state evaluation system and the collective bargaining agreement. But I, I always value student voice and elevating student voice and finding a way that we can we can gather student feedback. So uh, there's something we can do there. I think it's the difference would be using the terminology of evaluation. So, but we can certainly find. Uh, find a way to leverage student voice and student feedback for continuous improvement. Yeah, we can call it a feedback review. It doesn't need to be called an evaluation, yeah. but I was just using that term for our sake because we all know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> I think all of our students know what it means too. <laughs> okay. And then, so then the final category the, the final category is uh, family and community engagement. And this one is the one that's uh, the most process oriented for, I think, obvious reasons. Uh, the one here that I actually think next year should be easily measurable for us because we're building out the Parent Leadership Institute. So this is our first year of implementing the Parent Leadership Institute. Uh, so we should be able to start to then build on that in terms of participation, attendance, if the committee is so inclined to continue to invest in that uh, strategy. I think that would be, uh, you'll see that as an indicator. This one, usually we, uh, uh, usually this one is, is really built around building building out capacity and, and access for families across. Uh, so you'll see full, there's the full service community schools, parent leadership institute, 
communication and outreach to linguistically diverse uh, families and the Hispanic Student Success Task Force are the kind of the, the four buckets of the targets there. And uh, Ms. Martin, I just saw uh, Tony McKenna joined. Uh, just flying yeah. that for you. Thank you very much. Mr. McKenna, I think we are just about to wrap up our first topic, so I don't think we'll be much. You won't have to wait very long. <laughs> um, so uh, I would say, you know, if we're looking at this as a baseline year, if I'm understanding you correctly, to kind of set the set for the, the parent lead, the for the parent leadership institute, yes, yeah. you know, so the parent leadership institute. So you have several of these in the community schools. This is our first year with the community school managers. So mm -hmm. these are pretty big initiatives, significant investments for the committee. And mm -hmm. if the committee is going to continue moving in this direction for next year, which I would expect at this point, that'll be my recommendation. But that's part of the budget discussion. Mm -hmm. We'll have a we should have a lot of baseline data within these uh, areas that you can build on. Um, but I can, if, it's, if the committee is so inclined, I'll circle those two, the Parent Leadership Institute and Community Schools uh, in this area and see if there's something there that we can uh, quantify for the committee's consideration. Okay. Again, I think that those could lend themselves to kind of, you know, again, if this is our baseline year for those initiatives, I mean, just coming out of COVID, it makes sense that that we need to kind of set the, set the line right now. Um, so I, you know, if that's the kind of thing where we could set the line this year and then be able to look at kind of not, you know, I think attendance is a, it's a, you know, an output, it's a valuable thing to track. Uh, but again, impact is going to be, you know, the actual outcomes of what parents got out of the the experience and all that. That's what I'm going to want to see built in in that second year of, of review. Um, Ms. Martin, if I could add. Absolutely. Um, I also am really concerned, and I had mentioned this probably, I don't know, when we first started getting this type of data about the Latinx population um, and the gap, um, was wondering what measurables we can get specifically surrounding that. I know I had asked um, potentially for something um, something surrounding, you know, going from ninth to 10th grade, how many are, are making that trek, um, something also aligned with attendance. And... Um, and that population as well. So um, I would love some type of measurable just because, again, that population has been suffering, um, has been really uh, disconnected and has um, has a huge gap. I mean, all of our students really need to um, have the opportunity to move forward, but this population is gives me the biggest concern. So I, I really want us to make sure that we're not kind of moving past this without kind of assigning. And I'm not really, I'm not sure what the measurable needs to be, or the metric, but I think that we would be remiss if we don't establish some type of metric so that we're constantly looking at and uh, purveying that population. Mm -hmm. So let me do this, if it's okay with the committee, I'll circle the Hispanic Student Success Task Force as well. Uh, I'm, I'm sure of the three and I'm gonna prioritize that one to see if we can come up with something there. I, I did see a lot of head nods from the committee. So the Hispanic Student Success Task Force, we'll see if there's something we can quantify there. Uh, I'll, I'll bring back to the committee if for some reason and again, it would just simply be about the timing of the year. But let me see what I can let me see what we can come up with there. Uh, it's it's been an extraordinary and important focus, not of, of simply of Lowell Public Schools, but the community as a whole. And uh, I think there's a lot of promise of the Hispanic Student Success Task Force that Ms. Phillips has uh, been co-leading and co-sponsoring with community leaders. OK, I think that would be great. Are there any other areas that we want to? Ask to get some I'm, additional info on. Yes, Ms. Del Rosa. I'm not sure if this is possible, but in the area of family and community engagement, the ability to reach out to parents to help them to navigate the special education process, I, I think that's so important for our parents because it's a very overwhelming process. And I know we have sped packs and I know we have different areas, but for our parent liaisons who are in everyday contact with the parents who don't know how to navigate a system, I, I just think it's very important to kind of add that into our family engagement role. And I think that that could build in a lot of workshops to help 
our parents to grow and to be able to navigate our system maybe and to help them to realize, you know, signs and like, you know, readiness signs, maybe what, what concerns like where your child should be by grade level K, by grade level one, by grade level two. And maybe if your child's not here, what should you worry about? You know, and like kind of help help parents to kind of scaffold from there. And I don't know if that's something that is an option with the family community engagement. Let, um, let me take a note of it, Ms. Del Rossi. I think you, you bring up an important point, certainly of things that our families need, but it might actually fit more also in inclusive practices where special education is already identified just so that we can uh, kind of keep the flow moving, but that's okay. But let me take a look at it. I certainly have the note and I appreciate the feedback. Um, the feedback, and you know, I always look to your guidance around special education, so I appreciate the surface of that. Okay, can I, can I ask something too? Yes, Mr. Leg. No. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So, my colleagues and superintendent has been uh, speaking about the uh, subgroup, like uh, Hispanic group and uh, Black students. I I feel that um, I don't want to leave out uh, anybody uh, uh, subgroup. Uh, leave any subgroup out. So I feel that um, instead of uh, just concentrating on say Hispanic group or black group, I, I feel that uh, uh, our students, uh, especially the low income and the family of uh, uh, the, the students or family not speak, not speaking English as their first language uh, tend to have uh, trouble uh, in school. So I, I wanna uh, say besides say Hispanic and black, I want you to Superintendent uh, have a, uh, uh, a data on 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 the subgroup that have that that their family is not first language and and the low income family. Thank you, Mr. Lay. I appreciate you flagging that. Those certainly are two important populations for us to really elevate our services for. So uh, let me make sure I also take that note, and I appreciate uh, you raising that for discussion. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Well, I do think that we've hit across the four the four areas we wanted to. Does any member have anything else they'd like to surface right now? Or okay, if not, I think we can move forward. I would say, uh, Dr. Boyd. So we'll be looking uh, at our next meeting. Um, I'm I sorry a, to do that, but it's January. I, and I I appreciate it. I am in health and safety protocols throughout the course of this week. Uh, so I, I do have that one limitation and our agenda gets posted on Friday. I just don't want to overpromise. I'm gonna well, I'm gonna work, I'm gonna work at it and make sure that I can deliver, but I want to do this well. And uh I, I will target for Friday. I just don't want to disappoint because I am in health and safety protocols all the way through this week. Okay. I think every effort would be appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, I will do. And if you need extra tissues, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, we can move on then to our second uh, item of the agenda, which is an update for Mr. McKenna on uh, the uh, bid process for uh, an investigation for the HR office. Mr. McKenna. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, John McKenna, Assistant City Solicitor. Um, so we were sent um, the purpose to hire a uh, outside counsel uh, as per the uh, motion, uh, we we interviewed three um, <clears throat> attorneys from Boston. There's one more to interview, um, and then um, we can make a recommendation to the committee. City solicitor was uh, introduced yesterday at the council meeting. Uh, she started on Monday, Helene Tomlinson. So she's a new city solicitor. So um, there's one more attorney to interview. Uh, once we interview that attorney, then the city solicitor will make a recommendation uh, to the committee. So um, whenever you want us to report back, we can report back to the chair or however you want to do it. And it'll come from the new solicitor. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have, uh, Madam Chair. Well, Ms. Doherty, you can go first. I have a couple too. Well, I'm happy to let you start. You are oh, chair okay. personnel. I'm not even on the committee. I think that's okay. But uh, so my first few questions. So what I would like to see is, um, 
as you're going through this process, uh, the committee makes the ultimate selection. So I would like to get the background materials on the firms that you're talking to. I'm assuming they had to submit some kind of written proposal. Okay. Thank you very much. So if we could get that information on the, so four altogether that you've talked or will be talking with. That's correct. Okay. Okay. That would be very helpful. Okay. That's my first main one. Sure. Absolutely. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. Thank you. Martin. Jackie, you can go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, so I guess I actually thought we were getting uh, a list of suggested attorneys and that we were going to be involved in the process of uh, determining uh, who would best be suited. I know for me, I, I thought we were going to do some kind of a solicitation that wasn't going to be restricted by 30B. Um, obviously looking for somebody who has experience and established track record uh, with municipal and employment law. Uh, doing these kinds of investigations. Um, so I do have some concerns around uh, handing us, this is who we want to use. I would like to be, I think the full committee needs to be part of that decision process. I'd also interested in, in addition to their experience and uh, expertise in relevant areas such as MCAD, employment law, government hiring, things like that, um, what is their timeline uh, to be able to do this? I don't want a report that's going to drag out for a year. Um, you know, that the whole bandwidth and all that too. So I'm not and sure what? how that- I'm sorry, what was that last part? Their bandwidth to do bandwidth? the- Bandwidth? Yes, to do the investigation in a timely way, not take months and months and months. So what do you I'm mean not by the sure- bandwidth? I'm not following that. Um, that they would be able to start, like if it's a firm that does this kind of investigation, they've got uh, a staff that they'd be able to start in the next few weeks or something like that, as opposed to drag it out over several months, that would uh, be of importance to me as well. So I'm not sure how that fits in. I mean, I guess, Ms. Martin, you're looking for who's the four that they've come up with. And any proposal that they would have submitted, and Mr. McKenna, you can correct me, should include their background, what experience they have, what what they have on staff, and I would assume a proposed timeline. Yeah, Recall. and also their rates, of course. Right. Yeah. Um, I would expect just to go that I expect that the command we need have to have a scope of scope of services would have to be established as well, so they're not just going out and have a broad, unlimited scope of what they're doing. There'd be a scope of services. Um, we've already there's a small amount of of firms that do this, we have like four of the best in Boston that deal with these situations. So we'll get their rates, we'll get their experiences, but there'll have to be a scope of services and then we'll come back to the committee with you know the four names, with their availability, what their expertise is. Some you may find are, are, you know maybe better than others and make a recommendation. I'm gonna finish that up um, and make a recommendation to the city solicitor. The city solicitor can move on and present it to the board with all their credentials and you guys can make whatever decision or however your motion went or however you guys want to do whatever you're going to do to move this forward. Um, so that's the status of it. We have interviewed three out of the four bars, Boston attorneys and as soon as the city solicitor has um, finished the work, then the law department or through the city solicitor will make a recommendation to this committee. Could I just follow yep. up with a question? Thank you. Um, so was there a, a solicitation that was done, something, an, a proposal that was put out, or how so did you get the four that you got? We got them from um, recommendations from experts in the area, and, and there were the four um, attorneys. I, I can't get onto my email here because my computer's not signing in from for the internet, but I can send you over the list tomorrow. Uh, Gwen King, um, who was experienced in this matter and as outside counsel and other matters. She was one who was interviewed. Um, it was an attorney in Boston that runs all these investigations. I can't think of her name and I don't want to misstate her name. And then there was another younger attorney who represents municipalities and does these uh, schools and, and has this experience. Um, right? And her name is Greek and I'll totally mess that name up. And there's one, <laughs> one other, you know, um, you know um, Holy and Fog is the other one, you know, the Boston attorneys that they do that. So those are the four. We'll send in all the credentials just with the holiday season and everything. Um, 
We weren't yes. able to get all the interviews in. We were able to do three out of four. Why don't you do it before Helen left? And, and she was so nice enough to do and help me with the interviews. And then in between the holidays, um, you know, I got sick and with everything else coming in. Now the new city solicitor is coming in. So, um, you know, we have three out of the four interviewed the first time. We'll um, get their credentials, send it off to the committee in a report, and then you can decide, you know, how you want to proceed on, on this matter. Thank you. No, thank you very much. I think that that sounds great, John. So, and and I, I won't hold your, you know, your feet to this, but so for our scheduling purposes, if we were to schedule our next subcommittee meeting in say two weeks. Oh, yes. I, I would think that I could, would be able to get um, information hopefully by the end of this week. Okay. Um, and then present it to the city solicitor and then by the following week have something to send over to uh, the school committee members and then you could you know, review it and then we could meet after, you know, to discuss after you have time to meet it. So maybe if your next meeting's in two weeks, I could probably get you some information within a week that we have a week to review it and go over there, Perfect. their background. So I think that might I be the best way to handle it. I think that sounds great, John. So I would uh, make that in the form of a motion so that we'd um, be receiving the materials within a week if we could, through the uh, superintendent's office, please poll to schedule the next curriculum subcommittee in two weeks, you know, a week from two weeks from this one from tonight, if possible. You mean personnel? Personnel, what did I say? I'm sorry. Curriculum. Do you want to do it under a subcommittee or should we do it at the committee as a whole? Well, I think it's the subcommittee that's that's conducting the, the process. So I think it okay. needs to come back to the subcommittee. Yeah. But again, as always, all members are encouraged to come and participate. Are you looking at the 25th, Connie? I two don't weeks. have a I think there was a conflict. That's two weeks. I think yeah. there were conflicts with the 25th. I actually, I know I had a conflict on yeah, the 25th. Yeah, because Minerva was yeah. trying to set up a meeting before. It's it, now, that meeting <laughs> for me has been changed, so I'm available on the 25th. Okay, so within a week and have the HR on the 25th to poll for the 25th. Yes. Okay. And invite the, once again, the city solicitor's office to send a representative, Mr. McKenna or otherwise. I I, I cannot make it. I have to have a root canal that day and I can, oh. I have never had a root canal in my life. And so I just want to put it out there that I plan to be in bed in the fetal position for like, many hours after oh no well i have jerry duty that day so it's kind of the same thing <laughs> <laughs> oh. okay all right do you so what date do you want to go with would you be okay eileen if we move forward yeah yeah that's fine i just can't i de definitely can't do it that day oh yeah. i understand i understand i don't want to let this stretch stretch out too much you know you all set with me yes, yes. i think we all, all right. set. Well, thank you thank very you much and i'll be in, in touch with the superintendent and, and but, uh, good luck everybody thank you for your hard work <laughs> thank, you. Thank, thank you very thank much you. Thank, you, thank you thank you dominic the 25th is okay for you 25th okay for me 26th okay for me I don't think, I think we already. Is there something else scheduled on the 26th? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe I'm asking you. I don't know. So we'll let Minerva do the polling and see what we come up with. If we can, I mean, I'm fine on the 26th too, but we can. Why 30, wanna do 30 Monday. Yeah. Or 23rd. So we'll let her poll, see where we can get the most commitment. Yeah. But if it can happen in that, I don't want it to go past that week, if at all possible. Right. right. But if we can accommodate, I'm more than happy to do that. All right. So do that, you want your first option to be the 25th or just week ending 21? Week ending, whatever okay. that was. Well, if I know what makes us different. My ending the 27th. Okay, thanks, Meg. And tell Roger I said thank you for the offer too, will you? Who's on? All right. That's okay. So I need a first and a second. Well, I made the motion. I second it. Seconded by Mr. Lay. All those in favor say aye. Aye. 
Excellent. I believe we've covered our two topics. So I then I would entertain a motion to adjourn by Ms. Del Rossi, seconded by Ms. DeLay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Under an hour. Take that for your over-under. <laughs> <Good job. laughs>